Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Perspective. We'll be talking about the joint statement that has come from uh, Washington um, as far as uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Modi and their call for concentrated action against all UN listed terrorist groups, their um, condemnation of cross-border terrorism. Of course, we've expressed our annoyance also. And uh, of course, uh, uh, as far as uh, inclusion of Pakistan in this joint statement uh, shows uh, the kind of bias that is clearly uh, been exhibited as far as uh, both the US and uh, India is concerned. We'll be talking about the ramifications of this development as uh, geostrategically also and uh, as far as our relationship with other uh, countries is concerned. Of course, uh, as far as uh, our foreign office is concerned, we've condemned it. We've also said that we are going to um, see this as Pakistan being seen as a frontline state uh, as far as Afghanistan war is concerned is also uh, one of the main reasons for the kind of statement that has come forward, the kind of attitude that we are currently looking at as far as uh, India particularly and of course the US-India relationship is concerned. We'll be talking about all of this a little later on. We'll also be talking about uh, the Prime Minister's meeting with the IMF chief uh, after which of course we had the Finance Minister speak speak about uh, our inclusion and uh, um, uh, agreeing to the additional terms that have been put forward by the IMF, what this means for the future um, as far as the IMF deal is concerned, as far as the economy of Pakistan is concerned, as far as the efforts of the government, the finance minister, the concentrated uh, uh, efforts as far as the economic team is concerned to get the country back on its feet economically. All of that today um, on Perspective. I have with me Naila Chahan, who's a former ambassador. Thank you for being with us today. We we also have uh, with us Dr. Jamil Khan, who is a former ambassador. Thank you for being with us. And we have with us uh, Maliha Lodi, who is a former permanent representative of Pakistan to UN. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to go to uh, Maliha Lodi first. Uh, can you hear me, Maliha? Gee, I can hear. Gee, overall, as far as the statement is concerned, we've also seen the reaction that's come from the Foreign Office. How do you look at what is being said? And as far as uh, Pakistan, you know, India and U.S. relationship is concerned, uh, the kind of treatment that is being meted out to Pakistan, how, what is your overall reaction to what has uh, transpired there? Well, first of all, uh, as the Foreign Office also said, uh, mm. The reference to Pakistan in the context of cross-border terrorism in this joint mm. statement is mm. totally uncalled for. Uh, mm. It's baseless, unjustified, uh, and frankly, uh, there was absolutely no need uh, mm. for this uh, in a statement which had to do with a bilateral relationship with the U.S. and India. But uh, clearly, mm. the U.S. Mm. was trying to please India. Mm. So what I can say is that this will not in any way help the Pakistan-U.S. relationship which uh, is already at an inflection point. Uh, we mm. are at a crossroads. This is a relationship mm. that is undefined for the future. So mm. it's not going to help uh, uh, this uh, relationship uh, at all. Mm. I think also um, the fact uh, that uh, this uh, uh, statement has been issued by the Foreign Office is a good thing, but we need to go further than that. Uh, we need to make a demand uh, to the United States over this, uh, because the Dimash is a formal protest to a country. Uh, giving a statement is, you know, many times countries feel that uh, this is being done for domestic purposes, for domestic mm. political purposes. So I think it's important to, to send a strong signal uh, to the Biden administration, which, after all, uh, overlooked completely uh, Prime Minister Modi's abysmal human rights record uh, and ignored also the letter that... Uh, 75 congressional leaders had written to the administration saying that uh, human rights should be raised uh, with Prime Minister Modi. So I, I really don't see any indication that this was done. Mm -hmm. I think China is dominating uh, America's uh, attitude uh, towards uh, and its policy towards India because, as you know, uh, China is uh, the U.S. Uh, strategic yeah. priority right now in their foreign relations and their foreign policy. Uh, it is uh, to counter China, to contain China, and therefore they see India uh, as a country that can play the role uh, of a counterweight 
to China's ruin. You know, in your vast experience also, you know, on uh, uh, the international front as far as, you know, uh, relationship with um, the U.S. is concerned, the fact that our sacrifices as far as Afghanistan is concerned, you know, being a frontline state in that regard, um, our relationship has seen its highs and lows. But this is, it seems to be an unprecedented low, uh, you know, the way that this statement has come out at the time that this has come out. Like you said, it seems to be dominated uh, by our relationship with China. On the other hand, of course, there's the IMF also. Do you think that that politics is spilling over there also? No, not at all. I don't think the IMF, uh, I mean, I don't buy this business of geopolitics influencing uh, the funds of approach or response to Pakistan. I think the answer to that lies in economic steps uh, that we need to take, because unless we take them, we will not fulfill all the IMF conditionalities. So I don't buy that uh, for, for one uh, moment. But I do think that uh, it's important to recognize, uh, because you mentioned Pakistan's uh, role in the, in, in the, in the war on terror and counterterrorism, I think we have to really get over the emotionalism that seems to be attached to this relationship. Uh, relationships between countries are not based on emotion. They're based on hard interests. And as you know, the famous uh, saying, there are no permanent friends and there are no permanent enemies. Only interests are permanent. And remember, Pakistan made a strategic choice. Its strategic choice was its relationship with China. So if the United States is now making its strategic choice, which is it, it wants India uh, as its partner of choice in this region, well, that is their sovereign right, but not at the expense of Pakistan in terms of the impact uh, some of the dimensions of that relationship may have on us. For example, uh, the uh, advanced technology transfers uh, that are promised in the defense deals that have been uh, signed or about to be signed between the United States uh, and India, obviously will uh, further aggravate um, the imbalance, the strategic imbalance that exists in this region. So, you know, we in Pakistan have no issue if America wants to have a better relationship with India and vice versa. Uh, as I said, that's their sovereign right. But when it begins to affect our relationship, especially our security, uh, in terms of augmenting India's strategic capabilities and its defense capabilities, then certainly, uh, you, we certainly have a right uh, to have our voice heard. But what about overall, as far as, like I said, you know, emotionalism, which you are mentioning, perhaps it is attached to our relationship with the U.S. But then on the other hand, of course, there's this facade that we are looking at as far as India is concerned. Uh, the fact that it has unilaterally ignored the kind of, uh, you know, human rights violations that we see there as far as Kashmir is concerned, uh, the way that overall minorities are treated there, uh, the conditionalities over there. And, you know, that, that kind of ignorance that is coming from the U.S. also um, is something that, you know, Dimash, of course, is one option. But does Pakistan really have another option in this regard? No, I don't know what you mean by option. All a country can do uh, is to protest uh, to a bigger part uh, that mean, you are following I mean, a policy that is to our detriment. Yeah. But I do think that, uh, you know, overlooking uh, India's uh, or Prime Minister Modi's uh, human rights record, you know, again, it lays there uh, what we've known all along for years and decades, which is, again, that countries adopt these positions, sanctimonious positions on human rights, but it's interest that trumps that. So the values that a country may espouse in terms of its commitment to human rights are trumped by the interests of that country. So this is nothing new. I mean, this is what happens in real politics. And that's exactly what the United States has done. But I, I do think uh, there is a need for Pakistan to also see how best it can rework the relationship with the United States. The uh, U.S. remains a very important global player. Uh, and I think we need to have uh, a better relationship. But I fail to understand why so many visits to Washington by our officials over and over again have yielded nothing uh, if this is the result that we have seen uh, in this joint statement.
Right, fair enough. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us, Milia Lodi. I'm going to come back to the studio, uh, and Naila is here. Naila, you heard what uh, Milia Lodi has just said. She said, of course, there's a certain emotionalism attached to the Pakistan-U.S. relationship. At the same time, we do need to think about our, our relationship with the U.S., regardless of the U.S.-India relationship. How would you look at that? I, I would uh, I agree that uh, they should do the march. Of mm. course, that's the mm. normal diplomatic procedure. Mm. Uh, but uh, the international system is not changing, mm. and we need to adapt along with that. Mm. If you look at it in a bigger picture, mm. uh, m the timing of this visit, uh, Modi is concerned about his elections, mm. and this is basically. Uh, this paragraph that was added in the joint statement, it's not a joint statement on this. Okay. It is just one paragraph in it mm. out of 58 paras that there are. So uh, this is for his uh, consumption. His own, okay. Uh, domestic his consumption. His own image. And, and yes, right. for his people, for mm. his votes. Mm. On the other hand, the American system is also under challenge. Biden is not very secure. Uh, as uh, Malia Lodi also mentioned, se more than 70 uh, Democratic lawmakers have uh, written this letter mm. uh, condemning this, uh, you know, that earlier on uh, Modi was uh, persona non grata there mm -hmm. and mm. now he's being mm. given such a... Mm. But uh, these are political vested interests that, ha that have played uh, in this. But at the same time, Blinken was in China. So uh, the China factor that USA also realizes that they cannot uh, have the kind of confrontation with China as you know it's being uh, projected. Mm. They need to have good relations, and they also know that India is not a reliable ally, mm. and they also know that India's main defense, uh, you know. Uh, weaponry was coming from Russia. 80% mm. was coming from Russia. Mm. Now India ha is reducing it mm. and it is trying to uh, have a paradigm shift as far as its uh, defense uh, weaponry is concerned. Uh, but uh, mm. given the dynamics at this moment, mm. I think we have to be a little patient mm. and see how it plays out mm. while making our you know views uh, you know, to the government hmm. of the United States. Let me, let me go to Jamil Saab. Uh, Jamil Saab, you heard what uh, uh, Malia Lodi said. You heard what Naila is also saying. Overall, as far as, uh, you know, of course, I, I tend to agree with what Naila is saying. And, you know, of course, uh, your opinion is what we'd like. That in U.S., perhaps, you know, cannot uh, isolate uh, China and perhaps you know cannot have the kind of confrontation uh, that 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 it is it is largely being projected that they might uh, you know have with China considering the the role that China has to play in overall geopolitics at this time. That's right. In fact, in order to understand this joint statement, and uh, if we read between the lines, we will uh, probably find out that uh, uh, the. Uh, the one policy of the United States, um, one of the most important priority of the foreign policy of the United States is containment of China that everyone knows. And if we uh, uh, see this uh, um, joint statement, we will find that they have mentioned about the site South China Sea. They have mentioned that India strength in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. They have mentioned about uh, the, the cyber uh, uh, crime control. They have mentioned about space, mm -hmm. space um, the joint venture, and is that that amounts to that tenth amounts to space weaponization. So all these things what have been uh, in, incorporated there, I think quite a few of them relates to containment of China policy of the United States. Now once that happens, obviously China will react. And now we also have in our mind. Of course, that the Australia, UK, and US, and in which nuclear propelled uh, submarines are there in the Indian Ocean, India, India Pacific, uh, Indian Pacific Ocean, um, mm. uh, and port, which has been mentioned in this joint statement. 
uh, to us, you know, we understand that this uh, China contain, uh, contain, containment policy, and that's why uh, India is being um, empowered so much that the Biden in his opening few paragraphs says that is a defining partnership. And I call it a defining partnership for India and the United States because of the factors which I just illustrated. I call it a defining partnership for them, but it's a defining time for the countries of this region. It is China, Pakistan, the, the East Yo, and countries affected and affected by this kind of a pilot position. As we have fallen and as uh, uh, the Malia Lodi so just mentioned, that is their sovereign right to have a relation. But if it is at the expense of any other country, that country has a right to this point. Now, where in the world it's very rarely seen in the diplomatic um, uh, um, the kind of business that uh, name the country and they very categorically be saying that we uh, in paragraph 32, so that paragraph 32 warrant demands that at least if not recording our uh, that's uh, obviously the next escalation, but at least because and then of course in communication with China and some of our friends who have their interest uh, uh, once they read this uh, kind of a joint statement. So those reasons were definitely warranted. I think we have fallen short of them. And we know the stand interest we have in order to maintain that interest is heavier than what we are going to maintain. So this is a defining moment for us to take decisions because we were little uh, stopped once Biden um, and Modi had met and the same rhetoric. But there, that was not that strongly worded that Mr. Mr. Let me come back to you. Let me come back to you. Nayla, do you agree that it is time for us to take a defining um, you know, this is a defining moment for us as far as Pakistan-U.S. relations are concerned. Or like you said, perhaps it is overemphasized, you know, what's happening as far as between India and uh, China, uh, U.S. is concerned. Yes, I do believe that it's being overplayed mm. uh, because of the current dynamics. Mm. Uh, but relationships are not uh, moments or, you know, days. Mm. It is over years and decades, mm. and our relationship with USA is still on very strong foundation, although it has seen its ups and downs. Mm. Uh, the way this uh, joint statement has been drafted, uh, it is an umbrella document in which okay. they have uh, spoken of various areas of cooperation, whether it's in UNCLOS or whether it's outer space research or whether it's technology transfer or whether it's about defense cooperation. Um, there, there's several parts to this joint statement mm. and only one portion talks mm. about it. Mm. But that one portion is important to us because all the time it had been made very clear that relationship with one country should not impact relationship with another country. And also, isn't it you you know India's way of targeting you know or trying to perhaps uh, mar the outlook of of Pakistan you know and and you know embroil us in in that whole terrorism uh, facade that that we see. Uh, I personally feel that this is a reaction to their failure in the G20 working group meeting on tourism that they wanted to uh, host in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And we had done a lot of, you know, uh, campaigning on creating awareness on what was really going on in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And it dampened their uh, success of the G20. Mm -hmm. uh, consequently, this is uh, Modi's reaction to it. Okay. So he deliberately, I think, brought in Kashmir in this to kind of legitimize what they were trying to do uh, in the G20 working group meeting. Other than that, I think that uh, our relations with China are strong. And yes, it is a defining moment to be very clear where we want to go. Luckily, we are on the right side of history. Hmm. Um, India uh, is trying to play hmm. it so many cards hmm. that I think it will get embroiled in its own strategic deception that it does. Mm. Mm. So uh, mm. it will play out. In time, mm. you will see. 
because with Russia, the way they have... But of course, our relationship as far as, uh, you know, China is concerned is, is not exclusive or we're not, you know, again, we've always said that we're not part of any bloc. Yeah. And for us, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, like Malia Lodi also said, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And like you also said, it has its highs and lows, but it's Pakistan is an important, uh, you know, uh, geo... Uh, we have our own geostrategic importance as far as the region is concerned. And of course, we also have the Afghanistan, uh, what, what would we call it, baggage? Yes, but that baggage also is carried by India. Mm -hmm. Because I think in the joint statement also, there's a paragraph on uh, Afghanistan and mm -hmm. how they're going to cooperate in future on that. Uh, but it's a bigger baggage for USA. How they, you know, 20 years of staying there and what they have done mm -hmm. and how they had to depart from there. Mm. But yes, we have to protect our interests. And uh, as you well know, in real politics, there are no permanent friends. Like of it course, but there are interests. interests and, and we have to define our interests. Our problem okay. is that we haven't really uh, had that clarity because of our old association with United States. United okay. States is changing also. Mm. And it is fa uh, facing a lot of problems within mm. economic, political, social, and even currently the summit that our prime minister is participating in Paris mm. Mm. on global financial restructuring. That also is basically a recognition of failure of Bretton Woods system. Mm. So the world is changing. De-dollarization is being talked about mm. for a lot of economies. So we have to redefine our interests in economic domain as well as in political. Let me go to Jameel Sab. Jameel Sab, redefining our interests, what Naila is talking about vis-a-vis -vis the US. Um, you know, how, how do we do that in your opinion? Are we, are we clear enough with what we yeah. want as far as the US is concerned from, from this relationship? We are defining our interests and preparing our uh, interests and foreign policy. There are certain mechanisms and there are certain tools. Um, uh, basically, there are th three major modalities to do that. One is the traditional diplomacy, the other one is a public diplomacy, and third one is the uh, 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 legal diplomacy. So, um, if we try and uh, evaluate ourselves, to what extent we've been able to do that in past, we know that uh, uh, we had uh, we have been having a lot of impediments uh, because of our economy, because of our political instability, because of so many other factors. But all said and done, we've been making UN cry, but mostly in our own uh, on our own television channels and uh, within our own uh, country, we have not been able to um, uh, 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 to really bring the awareness to the public diplomacy in in the world. We have not been able to gather the. Uh, gather the support of the five uh, permanent members, except mm. China and at times Russia. Um, the, otherwise, um, um, if we only talk about Kashmir and the human rights, which uh, for which uh, Malia has also uh, mentioned about 75 uh, Congress uh, uh, members have raised that point, and there were uh, protests and processions uh, outside the White House. But mm. imagine during the joint uh, session or during the discussion, they very lightly mentioned that pluralism is the main uh, uh, um, beauty or something of uh, the democracy. And Narendra uh, Modi also responded that, yes, we are diversified societies and we, have, we don't have any human rights violation. So imagine because India looks at the other way, once it comes to the violation of international law by India, because India is now a countermeasure to China that we are all understand. Why under para six of this joint statement, um, the, the United States is supporting India, uh, although they are supporting previously also, to become a permanent member. And we definitely oppose that. And there are a group of countries that are opposing it. And then uh, law of seas, as I said, that in para number 29, law of seas, which is they are mentioning about China, South China Sea, whereas uh, they have not mentioned in, uh, any, in any other way uh, China by name and Pakistan in para 32 very clearly they have mentioned uh, uh, the, the name of Pakistan and they have asked us to pull the terrorism not, don't, do not allow the Pakistan oil 
uh, the, uh, the for, for, for the, the, the terrorism and then the tension group about six groups we should take action bombay attack and pakistan uh, all these things are mentioned in uh, 32 para 32 um, so uh, what does it in indicate it definitely indicates that um, the india what they have been saying for the last uh, almost 10 years at various platform they've been able to get that uh, incorporated in joint statement because the because of the mutual interest more interest of the united states and remember united states uh, the containment of uh, china policy um, the, it's the India uh, which could or, which could only throw the line at it and, and in the present situation. And the United States also says that India, we will help India out to wean out from Russian uh, equipment. We understand that in our case also, it's still about 70% of our, um, about now 60% of our arms consumption um, and uh, some of the equipment, they are American brand, but now we have started shifting towards China very fast, certain in, in our Air, Air Force Navy, we have gone much higher and we are not relying on any other country except China. So we are transiting that, but still we can't snap our relation all of a sudden, as my other two colleagues have mentioned. We It has to have a transition depending upon the ground reality and depending upon what way the geopolitical shapes up in the future under the backdrop of what I just mentioned about the containment of China policy right. and China Belt and Road um, Initiative and CPAC, which is which is our flagship uh, China uh, passing through our territory. So once we have these factors in our mind, we will probably find out. And then space, I have already mentioned. Besides that, the engine, the uh, joint fabrication of the fighter planes, and PECA agreement has already been signed. And PECA is such a dangerous agreement for China or country like. Right, but uh, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for this segment. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Jamil Khan, thank you for being with us. Naila Chauhan, thank you for being with us. We'll come back after a short break to talk about, uh, of course, uh, the meeting with the Prime Minister as far as the IMF head is concerned and also pursuant to that, the uh, Finance Minister's talk today in the National Assembly and uh, the kind of agreements that we expect as far as the IMF is concerned, as far as the, the road that economy is likely to take in the next couple of weeks uh, after a short break. Welcome back. We're, we're going to talk about, uh, of course, the Prime Minister's meeting as far as uh, the IMF MD is concerned. And pursuant to that, of course, we also saw the Finance Minister speak in the National Assembly. The concessions that are expected in the new budget still and what it means for the economy, what it means for the changes, for the people, all of that today. Um, I have uh, with me Dr. Sultan Ali Heather, who is strat uh, strategy consultant, founder, Hikmat Amli, consulting expert also an economist, thank you for being with us. Uh, Dr. Sultan, like I was saying, you know, this is, um, it's, it's rather short notice uh, to affect the kind of changes that the IMF is asking us to do. Um, do you think it's going to be able, uh, you know, certainly the government is committed to ensuring that that happens and we want the ninth review to go through, but what do you expect now? Uh, first of all, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, one thing I would like to, Ed is, I, I'm not a doctor by the way. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, in terms of the what IMF is asking us to do, uh, I think we need to understand what IMF does and why do we get into IMF first. So let's draw that baseline once again. Okay. So first of all, IMF gives any nation a certificate once they enter a program that this nation has a plan or a business plan so they are in crisis, financial crisis, and there's a risk that everybody views that they may not be able to meet their commitments and they might default. Okay. So people will not be willing to lend you money, people will not be able to do transactions with you. So when IMF says that yes, now we have worked with them, now they have a plan, and if they stick to that plan, they will not be defaulting on their commitments. Hmm. So that is why IMF gets into what is your budget? Okay. So one thing is, now that we understand that, 
So IMF gets involved when IMF sees that, okay, so these are the revenues that you're planning to generate. Mm. This is, these are the additional fundings that you're planning to get. Mm. And this is the expenditure you're going to incur. Right. When IMF sees certain risks in the money you might be getting, right, then IMF says that you may have to cut down certain expenditures so okay. that you do not incur that risk so that they can give you that certificate. Mm. So at a very high level, we can say IMF demands, while they are usually seen as very unreasonable, mm. but many of these demands may not be as uh, unreasonable, okay. right? At the same time, IMF may be like a surgeon, right? But then there are uh, needs of the people. So people may not be so you're able saying that to there go has to, that to be that balance. That balance. So, so the political right. government then mm. is, is in that dilemma and political government is responsible. So we have an elected government uh, which is representing the people. So it mm. has to do that. So that is the negotiation that usually happens, okay. right? So it's no hard and fast in terms of IMF also understands that. Government also I understands IMF. So, you know, it's so, okay. it's, so it's they have to keep going back and forth and asking yes, exactly, you know, whatever exactly. they can for the people. And they have to, of course, at their exactly, end ask exactly. whatever, whatever. Usually what happens is that people mm. get really, or the commentators, they get at times, they get really frustrated. Okay. That why it's taking so long. So give us an answer right now. Why are they but not doing this, anything? But, but having said that, isn't this exceptionally long? No, no, it, it has been. It has been exceptionally long. Mm. And unfortunately, uh, I would also say that um, it's not just uh, this government, it also includes the previous government because mm. you see this program uh, started in 2019. Mm. So the negotiations started in 2018, the program finally it took almost a year uh, mm. for this program to start, right? Mm. So that, that was a long negotiation, then the program started. Then in terms of the reviews, there were certain commitments that we had made but we were also uh, slow in mm. implementing those, right? And, and do you agree that there has been a trust deficit that has been perpetrated because of the last government also? We saw statements that went forward and, you know, things, the attitude generally. Uh, that do you think, do you think that contributed at all to the kind of delay that uh, you've uh, so, so what I would say is mm. it's not just the statement, it's also mm. some of the actions or lack of action, mm. right? Mm. So if you go in terms of the fundamentals of the program, what actions that the government is supposed to take. So usually... For example, the increases that had to come and didn't get happen. Increases had to come in one area that I personally ha have mm. been focused on is, for example, actions related to state-owned enterprises, right? Mm. So there were certain actions that were to be taken, but the previous in the, during the previous government also, it took longer for those actions to take mm. place while they were much simpler actions. Okay. Right? Because they were b politically uh, motivated, because the decisions, of course, you know, uh, were perhaps, you know, the time that they were supposed to be made were not taken, the, the untimely manner, they were delayed in some cases. There was also, you know, uh, perhaps political reasons for not doing um, them at uh, the time. I, in general, I mean, the, the, uh, to, to give a very balanced perspective, Gee. Gee. I believe that I like to be very self-critical. Mm. So in terms of uh, Pakistanis as a nation, I would say that let's be self-critical mm. overall, right? Mm. And uh, as I heard uh, the defense minister also re recently saying that, mm -hmm. that it is mm -hmm. not this government or previous government, it's collectively our uh, fault. Mm -hmm. So usually we delay things too much, mm -hmm. right? So we take them to the last moment. So mm -hmm. usually our reaction is that, okay, uh, once we get the program, we get the funding, we are relaxed. So then when mm -hmm. we come close to the review, then mm -hmm. we start, try to start doing things. Okay. So perhaps it has more to do with the way we do things, they implement things. Political considerations, yes, they would be coming in, but that pressure will always be there. But the reforms that Dar Saab specifically uh, yeah. talked about today, he yeah. proposed in the National Assembly today, they're highly significant, of course. Yeah. But if they're executed, what do you expect? Are they going to be a benefit for the people also? Do you think that, you know, th there seem to be more pros to this than anything else? So, so of course, uh, there's some, you see, basic <coughs> hygiene issues, right? Mm. For example, one of the things that he was talking about, and he said uh, that's going to uh, perhaps make him unpopular with some people. Mm. For example, the people who are drawing multiple pensions, mm. right? So he's saying it's generally unfair Mm. that you are drawing pension from multiple places, right? Mm. So he said there's some of these things. So while on one hand, the government is generously uh, increasing mm. 
uh, both the pensions and uh, the salaries. But mm. on the other hand, there are these kind of leakages that need to be stopped. It's very unfair. Mm. Uh, so when it's unfair to the government, that means unfair to the exchequer, which means unfair to the taxpayers, right? So and to bridge those gaps, then more taxes have to be imposed. So mm. some of these, of course, there are uh, many of these reforms. They are commonsensical mm. reforms. Mm. So they have to be uh, implemented. But they haven't been taken because, uh, particularly if we, I mean, of course, we have to sort of talk about the last government here because, you know, there has been an inability to, like you said, you know, this is in a, in, in a sense a leakage for the government to, to, to unable to stop it. I mean, it's been there for a while. Sure. Is, mm -hmm. is, for, is, it, is it a popularity issue? Is it, you know, because politically speaking, of course, though that, that is an issue for every government. Th that is an issue for every government and uh, last government's uh, execution uh, was uh, less than perfect for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, now the, the jury is out in terms of how that compared to this government or the previous government. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say th it's a mis mixed bag. Mm -hmm. One thing is yes, you see the number of finance ministers uh, changed in the previous government mm. a number of times, right? Mm. So yes, so there was a lot of, it. that is a self-recognition mm. that uh, things were things not- Things were perhaps not happening the way happening they should have as well, right? right? So we mm. had three finance ministers mm. for that matter. Mm. In this government also, yes, we did uh, see a change of guard. And uh, at times you would say, I would say, yes, if things are not working out, it's good that you do have that change mm. and you do see uh, positive uh, outcomes coming from But the that. kind of frequent change that we yeah. saw in, on, in such an important ministries, in such an important field, was perhaps, you know, uh, uh, indicative of, of, a, of a larger problem. Exactly. And when it comes to IMF, mm. then you see, I mean, then you can be slightly sympathetic with them also from mm. this instance, right? Mm. So you're dealing with, you know, so who you're dealing with, what they're doing, how they're doing. So there are a lot of series of changes which are happening. Mm. So that is why, uh, as you see here, many foreign mm. analysts talk about Pakistan. Mm. They say Pakistan is a hard country. Mm. And this, these kind of things are exactly what make it hard. Mm. But overall, um, as far as, uh, you know, this program is concerned, in, in terms of putting pressure on those who are already paying tax, it I think it, it uh, works towards taking a little away from that, right? Lessening the burden there, no? Uh, it does, but you see, in any case in Pakistan, <coughs> that is a larger debate also in terms of people who are getting or generating income mm. as part of documented economy. Okay. So they pay a lot of taxes, right? Mm. Mm. And everyone pays indirect taxes for sure, right? right? Yeah. So, but these people, for example, the salaried people, many mm. of the folks here, mm. so they are getting mm. their salaries and their tax is pre-deducted, right? right. They, then on top of that, they pay those indirect taxes like sales tax and on everything, mm. right? Mm. So, in any case, uh, that is a more of a reform issue. It is more of a culture issue and so I think everyone needs to come together. I, I feel in this instance, in my personal opinion, for many years, also, I mean, taking back in when, when the previous government was here, one thing the current Prime Minister, Shahbaz Sharif, he used to talk a lot about when he was the opposition leader that we need to have a charter of economy, mm. right? Which is something that even now they're talking even about. Even now they're talking so about. Zadari Saab also said that, you know, it doesn't matter exactly. who, but he's willing to come and sit with them. So about if it. we do come together, you know, mm. I mean, that can really help as a nation at the top, at mm. the leadership level, if we decide, yes, we need to be paying taxes and we need to do, mm. at least we agree on certain principles. Mm. So now that will do two things. One, mm. it will give a very positive message mm. downstream to mm. the people who are paying taxes. So people mm. will be coming forward and paying taxes. Usually people justify uh, avoiding paying taxes, right? On the other hand, when we're talking about uh, dealing with the foreign entities, mm. it may be foreign investors. Recently, there was a lot of talk mm. in conference and a mm. lot happening in terms of attracting foreign investment and uh, facilitating that, right? Mm. So whether it's foreign investors, whether it's foreign lenders, whether mm. it's multilateral entities, whether it's other governments uh, in terms of G2G agreements, if there is some sort of consensus, so then they can predict because anyone mm. who is investing or lending Pakistan mm. for medium to long term, mm. they would want to know what are your policy positions, whether they're going to change or not. Right, fair enough. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Thank you so much for being with us.
Sultan Ali Heather, thank you for joining us. Overall, of course, there's agreement that as far as Pakistan is concerned, one, there has to be structural reform that has been on the agenda for the longest time. The former government came in with the mantra of reform, whether it was, you know, uh, reform in the economy sector or the judicial side or you know multiple other sides but at this time of course we have you know a government that is agreeing that there has to be primarily a charter of economy regardless of, of the governments regardless of political affiliations that needs to be there to move forward as far as Pakistan is concerned to be not be grappling with the kind of economic challenges we see today whichever government comes in next there should be an econ, econ charter of economy that is uh, adopted from the point go and policies that continue long term. Let's hope that we can see that. Let's hope that we can see those structural changes that are invariably needed for a prospering Pakistan. Thank you so much for joining us today.